you like to turn with me to uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, which is on page 1567 in your Pew Bibles. Pew Bibles. I mean, that's with verses 1 to 13. And he, it's the Lord Jesus, said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and laid them up a high mountain where, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And they appeared before Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. He said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Just let us put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, but they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they were they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him Everything they wished, just as it's written about him. So read God's word. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, as we come to look at your word, we pray that you will speak to us. We pray that we will find food for our souls. Father, to this end, we ask that in your mercy, the Holy Spirit will be active amongst us. We thank you that he is the one that declares. Jesus to us. We, Lord, need to see Jesus. We need to see the one who is the Lord and the King, to whom we can bow and know as our Saviour in our own hearts. And to be assured of these things, Lord, help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I think there might be some of you that are here for the first time today. Uh, so I'm sorry you've got me to listen to. Uh, if, if you're put off by that, don't, don't be put off by coming back. Normal service will be returned, I'm sure, uh, very, very soon in the next week or two. Now, this, is the, this is the holiday period. But I'd, I'd like us to look at this, this very well-known passage, I guess, from Mark's Gospel, chapter to 9. Life often has turning points, doesn't it? And there's a lady in our church, she's now died, she knew the Lord. But during the Second World War, when she was a young lady, and uh, there was a bombing raid, she dived down into an air shelter and they waited a few moments and they were going to pull the door shut and as they were doing that, there was a knocking on the door and uh, two young men came into the shelter. One of those young men talked to this lady who was at our church and sometime later they got married and they were together the rest of their lives. That was a real time, wasn't it? Going down into that air raid shelter. And you may be able to look back to turning points in your own life. Of course, the greatest turning point is uh, when we come to know Christ, the Saviour and Lord. But here in chapter 9 of Mark, we have something of a turning point uh, right at the beginning of uh, Mark's Gospel. Uh, Mark 
introduces his his uh, his gospel with with these words: the beginning of the gospel that Jesus about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Gospel of Mark gives us reasons why we should understand that Jesus is the Son of God. And up until this point, uh, Jesus has been doing all sorts of things, saying all sorts of things that would lead us to that conclusion. But now there's a turning point. He goes up the mountain, there is this incredible event of the transfiguration, and then when he comes down, his face is set towards Jerusalem. Now he's going to Jerusalem. That's where his heart is set, his face is set like a flint to Jerusalem and all that is going to happen there. Great turning point here in Mark's Gospel and the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, we're going to draw out uh, one, two, three, four, five things about Jesus from this passage. I notice there are some younger ones here. I wonder if you can spot what these five things are about Jesus. I wonder if you can tell me at the end of the service what these five things, or at least some of these things, are about the Lord Jesus. Well, the first thing I want you to notice is that uh, Moses and Elijah appear. Now, this isn't the only gospel that these are events described in, and there are other details in the other gospels. I think I particularly like uh, from, from uh, Luke's Gospel, it tells us that Jesus went up the mountain to pray. And then Peter came to John and fell asleep. Well, it wasn't the first time they were going to do that, is it? Gethsemane, think of that. And they fell asleep, they woke up, and then this event took place. And there is Moses and Elijah. Again, in Luke's Gospel, we're told that they talk together about what Jesus is going to accomplish what he is going to do. So when we get to the death of Jesus, he may look like Jesus is a victim. He may look like he's in the, in, in, in the grips of a set of circumstances that he can't drop. But knows what he is accomplishing. But why Moses and Elijah? Why not Jeremiah and Isaiah? Why not two other great figures? Why Moses and Elijah? in the commentaries, lots of, lots of things that uh, are possibly said about this. But let me uh, just give you a verse from the very last chapter of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi. And there Malachi is looking forward to coming the Messiah. And, and this is what he says in chapter 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great day and dreadful day of the Lord. There in the very last chapter, looking forward to the coming of the Lord, there's Moses and Elijah mentioned together, side by side. In fact, the disciples ask Jesus about this, about Elijah and his coming, and Jesus says Elijah has come. That was John the Baptist. But Moses and Elijah. And you remember when Jesus is risen from the dead, he is talking to two disciples on the road to Emmaus and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, expounding to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Old Testament is above everything else about Jesus. It points forward to the coming of Christ. And Moses and Elijah particularly sum up the totality of all the hopes and the promises of the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah. And Jesus fulfills all of those hopes and all of those promises. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament and all that it looks forward to. I think particularly of the temple uh, and the tabernacle before it, you think of all the blood sacrifice that there was. Day after day after day after day, these animals being uh, slaughtered. Doesn't it just cry out for a sacrifice that would mean that these sacrifices day after day after year after year, century after century, millennium after, would no longer be needed? It cried out for that. 
And Jesus fulfills that. He was our Passover lamb, sacrificed for us, the lamb of God. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. And people ask the first one. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Then, uh, secondly, we, we see the glory of Jesus here being uh, revealed in, in a quite literal way. His, his clothes are, are, are changed. Uh, in this translation, it's like as white as white air could bleach them in, with modern day uh, detergents. And detergents mean whiter than white. You know, ever since TV, they've always been an excellent and white from the last one. But, but this, this is, this is glorious. And it's not just his clothes, but, but Jesus himself is changed. And light shines out of him. Matthew's Gospel tells us that his face shone like the sun. We read from Revelation at the beginning of the service. And uh, there is a description of the, of the Lord Jesus at the beginning of, of the book of the book of Revelation in chapter 1. And in particularly verse 16 of that verse, of that chapter, we read this. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Tell us about Jesus. Well, Mark's gospel starts off by saying Jesus is the Son of God, and and uh, much of the question of about what, he, what is who is it? Who is Jesus? And you remember at the, the previous chapter, uh, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples, "Who do you say that I am?" And Jesus uh, is. Uh, Peter confesses uh, Jesus to be the Christ. What about you? He asked. Verse 29. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about it. Well, why did he warn them not to? Well, because there were so many ideas about who the Christ was. And well, when Peter said, You are the Christ, when well, did he have a full understanding of what that meant? Or was it just a beginning of a delivering of the truth? In Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, the Lord Jesus asks questions of the leaders. They have been uh, questioning him, but now he turns the table on them after he's answered all those questions. He asks them a question. While Jesus was teaching the temple cause, he asked, how is it that the teaching of the law say that the Christ is the son of David. David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. And how can he be his son? Now they all knew that the Christ would be the son of David. What they didn't know was that the Christ would be David's Lord. David's Lord. In other words, David's God. The Son of God. As David was telling us from Psalm 110 that that discussion is around. But here we have the Lord Jesus Christ being revealed in his glory. The glory of Jesus. David's Lord, the glory of God. Here's the second point. Jesus is God. Jesus fulfills all the hopes and the promises of the Old Testament. The second thing is, Jesus is God. That might seem a very basic statement uh, for those of us who have been Christians for a very long time, but isn't it glorious? And isn't the deity of Jesus attacked? Every generation attacks the deity of Jesus, even from within the apparent confessing church. And part of the fight of faith 
is to retain this clear understanding with rejoicing in our heart. Jesus is God. He is the Lord. He has all authority in heaven and upon earth. There is only one invincible power in this world. It is Jesus Christ and His plans and His purposes. Hallelujah. Then, thirdly, notice this. The fright of the disciples. In Mark's Gospel, we're told that, that they're frightened. In the other Gospels, uh, this becomes terror when they hear the Father speaking. So notice the fright of the disciples, the, the terror of the disciples in this situation. Why is it? Well, surely like others before them and after them, confronted with God himself, they felt their sin. I mean, when God spoke to you, didn't reveal himself to you in this kind of dramatic way, but when he spoke to you by his spirit when you were first becoming a Christian, what did he do? When he convicts us of our sin, doesn't he? This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us of our sin, to show that we're sinners before a holy God. Think of Isaiah, chapter 6. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. And what does he say? Woe is me. Woe is me. He's filled with a sense of his uncleanness, of his sin. Woe is me. This is what he feels. One day this Jesus will come again. I mean, this isn't just an experience just confined for these disciples here on the mountain with Jesus. There will come a time when Jesus will come again. And he will not come then with his glory hidden. He will come and every eye will see him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And what did Jesus himself say about those days? People will cry out for the mountains to fall on them and the hills to cover them. Because it would happen. They all want it to happen. On that day, those that are not believers will see that their lives that they lived without Christ was just a sinful mirage. They thought they had life. They thought it was solid, they thought it was substantial, they thought it was real. But it was nothing. I, I, I caught the end of a program on, on TV about Whitney Houston. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her surname. Uh, do you know Whitney Houston, do you? Yeah? Great singer who died some years ago. She was 49 when she died. She, she was very beautiful. She had a stunning voice. I will always love him. I think these iconic recording. Can you hear it in your head? Soaring voice. And she was very popular. Lots of famous people. Was herself very famous. And as I say, she died tragically at the age of. 49. And like many of that generation, particularly in America, they had contact with the gospel. She sang and recorded, Jesus loves me. Now, I don't want to pass any judgment on it, but could it be that in that early years, that message of Jesus and the call to trust him as Lord and Savior was traded for fame and for fortune for a mirage? sad. I look at my life and it's certainly not as exciting as uh, Whitney's life was. Certainly not with all the experiences that she
we had nothing like that. I was a very boring, I was a very boring life. But listen, I can look back on my life and I can think of people that were raised from the dead and I saw that happen. I don't mean literally physically, but people who were not believers, people who were dead in their sins and trespasses, God came to them and gave them new life and they changed and they continue to be changed. Would you forsake seeing that? Would you leave that for the dross of the world? And yet people are living lives of a sinful mirage all around. Is that you this morning? You've not yet come to Christ? Listen. The fright of the disciples, the sense of sinfulness tells us this. We need a saviour. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. Jesus is God. We need a saviour. The fourth thing is this. There's the voice of the Father. The voice of the Father. The cloud appears, verse 7. And envelops them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. It's very simple, isn't it? A little complicated. This is what the Father is saying. This is what he's saying to these disciples on the mountaintop. This is what he's saying to you and me this morning. Listen to my son. There are so many voices in this world in which we live. So many voices telling us to live this way or to give our lives for that. We need to cut it away and we need to focus on what Jesus said. Listen to him. Let me just pick out one thing that he said. And you will know this very well, particularly those of you who have been coming here for a number of years, because there is on the outside of this church a question, are there many ways to God? The verse goes on, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Can you help me finish it off? No one comes to the Father except through me. And there's that verse beaming down the A2. I notice it when I come up and down here, I don't come off of because my, my in-laws live over the other side of the Blackwood Tunnel. What a great verse. It's what Jesus said. Listen. To him, we need a saviour. Jesus is that saviour. There's no one else. He's the only one. It's him and him alone. Jesus fulfills all the hopes and promises of the Old Testament. Secondly, Jesus is God. Thirdly, we need a saviour. Fourthly, Jesus is that saviour. And fifthly, and finally, verse 8. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. In this event, finally, we notice the presence of Jesus. His majesty and glory is now hidden. It's hidden behind the, the veil of humanity. There he is, just an ordinary human being, apparently. An ordinary human people, a being whom people have passed in the street and not realised that this was God. It's extraordinary, isn't it? What was it like for Jesus? Coming back down that mountain with his face set like flint to Jerusalem, knowing all it would mean for him. What did it mean? Did he always look like God the Son? Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Now he served in very literal ways, he'd been doing that all his life. But you remember on that last night when he was with his disciples, he took a towel and he wrapped it around him, he knelt down and he washed the feet of his disciples. Does that look like God the Son? That's our Saviour. 
washing the feet of his disciples. We need him to wash us inwardly from our sin. This wonderful Saviour. What about when he went to the cross? And he's hanging on the cross. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you think he felt like the Son of God at that point? Not the glory of the Mount of Transfiguration now, but the agony of the cross. The Father turned away from him. In the sense, of the Father's favour was turned away. And now, now just the, the, the wrath of God upon the Son as he was bearing it in our place. And all his disciples had deserted him. All his people had rejected him and despised him. And there he hangs between heaven and earth, unwanted. Did he feel like the Son of God? I don't think he felt like the Son of God. But he knew he was the Son of God because his faith never wavered, not for a moment. And when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was not seeing that as a cry of despair. That wasn't a cry of despair. It was a prayer. Oh, Father, why are you forsaking me? Have I not now atoned for the sin of all my people? It was a prayer, not just for himself, but for you and for me. And just after he cries that prayer, at the end of the three hours of darkness, the scripture tells us, light comes back to the world. See, I think Jesus knew he was getting to that point where he had nearly, he had nearly completed it. And he cries out to his Father. And then shortly after the light comes, he says triumphantly, He is finished. The price has been paid. And then he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the work had been done. The debt had been paid. Jesus had come and perfectly fulfilled being servant and sacrifice. The Saviour who did it by being servant and sacrifice. Jesus fulfills the hopes and promises of the Old Testament. Jesus is God. We need a saviour. Jesus is that saviour. He was saviour by servant and sacrifice. So as we come to a close, as we draw these things to a close, first of all, you know, is there someone here you're not a Christian? In your heart of hearts you're not a Christian? You're living that mirage life. A life that's not real. The unbelieving life, no matter how real it, it might seem, how substantial it might seem. Uh, the guy who, um, who, who owns Bill Gates. Billions and billions of pounds. And he, he does a lot of good with his money, doesn't he, in the world? As far as I know, he doesn't know Christ as Saviour and Lord. But without Christ, all that money, all that power, it's a mirage. What we need is Jesus. Everything else is rubbish in comparison to him. Are you living a mirage life? Are you focused upon the things of the world? That are you here at church? You may. You may sing the songs, you may give lip service to God and to Christ and Son, but that's as far as it goes. You can go out here and Jesus being Lord of your life is just not a reality. You're caught up in the 
calls you again this morning. Come to Christ. Turn to Him. Find a real life. Come to know what it is to be satisfied with Jesus. This is what happens when we, when we confess that we've got our lives all wrong. Jesus, we need, I need you bigger and better than me to, to rule in my life. I need you to forgive me. I need you to come into my life to give me new life. And when that happens, when that's a reality, we find that Christ himself, who he is and what he does, deeply satisfies. Now that is a power within that destroys desire for the world. I'm not saying we're perfect. But there is a, a reorientation that takes place in our hearts. We're told that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. Does that in our lives when he becomes our Saviour and our Lord? What could be better than that? Turn to him this morning if you do not know him. And for those of you that that are Christians this morning and you know that Christ is your Saviour and Lord, can I ask you this, you know, are there times when you don't feel like a child of God? You know, it can happen for all sorts of reasons. It may be that you're treated badly because you're a Christian, you're picked on at work or whatever it might be. It may be circumstances that aren't in your control, illness or or whatever it might be, just come upon you and life's tough. Or it might be because of sin. And we've kind of turned away from the Lord and, and there's been that distance come in. We think to ourselves, how can I do that again? And we don't feel like children of God. This, this, this event in the, on the Mount of the Transfiguration. It's given to us to assure us that Jesus is who he says he is, that he's done what he came to do, and if he is ours, then we are his children. It is to give us assurance. This is to what Peter wrote later on, after all of these events were passed. Jesus had risen and gone back to heaven. He said this, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. See, Peter's writing. Now this isn't just some made up idea, some cleverly thought out fable. No, this is real. How do we know it's real? Look, we saw the transfiguration. We're eyewitnesses. We're recording it here. It happens. And he's declaring to us a fresh again this morning. Look. Jesus fulfills the hopes and the promises of the Old Testament. He is God. We need a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. And he did it by being servant and sacrifice. Think on those things. Christian brother and sisters, let assurance fill your heart again. Your Father in heaven by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, as we bow before you, we thank you that we're not left to guess at who Jesus is and what he came to do. Thank you that your word clearly declares it to us. Father, we thank you that you said this, speaking of Jesus, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, my beloved son. Oh Father, may we know something of that pleasure of Jesus in our own hearts. May we be content with him. May we be satisfied, Father, with the things that he has done on our behalf. And 
may, O oh God, make us the sons and daughters of you, yours of you. Glory to you. For they here this morning that, that don't, don't know you. Or give them grace to see that they need Jesus and to trust him. Lord, any that are, are mixed up because of all sorts of things they've heard about the truths of your word and interpretations and all the rest. Lord, give clarity by just looking at your word and seeing what it clearly says. And oh, our Father, if there are those amongst us, we just, we don't feel much like your sons and daughters. Oh Lord, renew that sense of assurance that it is not rooted in us. It is rooted in who Jesus is. Lord, we don't want to, to be casual about sin. But Lord, we want to confess our sins, to know your cleansing, day by day. But Lord, too, that in difficult circumstances, and when we're treated wrongly, the Father, we will have that eye that sees beyond the here and now and trusts Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and upon earth, and to know that all your purposes towards us, even through the difficult things, are good and acceptable in every way. Help us to trust you and Lord, in doing this to give glory to you. Father, as we bow before you, we do pray for that meeting tomorrow evening uh, that Henry will be speaking at to the trustees. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of truth. Lord, we pray that truth will be clearly established in that meeting. And thank you, Lord, that you can change hearts and minds. Lord, may you do that. And Father, may you give great grace to Henry to speak the truth in love, to be your spokesman in that situation. Lord, we commit these things to you, we commit ourselves to you, and we do so, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.